Hi, I'm Sharon Novak of Beekman, New York, and this is our Beekman, New York Fine Jewelry Conversation with Siddharth Kaziwal of Muni the Gem Palace. And most of you probably do know that Sid is the creative director of Muni the Gem Palace, as well as the ninth generation of the Kaziwal family to be jewelers. Thank you. We're delighted to have you here. I'm very honored to be here, Sharon, and thank you and Kyle Week for a conversation. Same. Um, we're going to pick up our conversation at right. around 1727 with the formation of Jaipur under Maharaja Jay Singh. But yes. before that, I just want to spend a minute on the Mughal right. Empire. So our listeners may or may not know, but a lot of the elements that we traditionally refer to as being part of European high jewelry date back to techniques that were definitely used in the Mughal Empire, which is 1527 to roughly 1857, and at its peak exceeded a third of the British Empire and covered most of the Indian subcontinent. So some of the elements you may or may not know are chandelier earrings, the use of cabochon gemstones, the carving of gemstones into fruits, berries, leaves, and flowers, right. enameling, specifically minakari, which you and I will be talking about in detail, and um, quite a few other elements that we're going to discuss as we go forward and look at both how the Mughal Empire continues to influence modern jewelry, but also the ways in which we see differentiation from that time period to now. Yes, exactly. Because the influence of Mughal jewelry, as you can see, it's still very prominent in Indian jewelry. And as we go on, we, we're going to discuss the specialities of like the Meenakari, which is the enamel work, or the Kundan technique, which was the gold leaf setting work that, you know, you would cluster it around the stones. So we'll... Cool. So 1725, um, your family becomes the, or after 1727, your family moves eventually to yes. Jaipur from Agra. Yeah, we were officially um, appointed as the jewelers to the royal family. And on invitation of the Maharaja, we were invited to the walls of city palace. At that time, Jaipur was not a city of, of uh, four million that it is now. It was a it was a new city. Jaipur was actually one of the f first planned cities of India. And it's, if you'll see it, it's architecturally amazing. And when they built it, so what the Savai Jai Singh's vision was that he wanted this city to be the center of culture and art. And he invited the best jewelers, the best astrologers, the best doctors, the scientists. You know, that's why we have that. Jantar Mantra, the Astrological Museum. Mm -hmm. And so that's how the city was, was built with that vision. And uh, jewelry being a very important factor in the royalty's life, um, the best of the best were invited, whether they were the stone cutters, the enamelers, or uh, the setting, you know, like Kundan work mm -hmm. they did. And uh, till today, Jaipur is called the jewelry capital of India. So that's where the history is quite interesting of our city. And Jem Palace being one of the oldest families there, we are like proud to be from Jaipur and, and Jem Palace and Jaipur are like synonyms to each other. So that actually brings us to my next question. So your family becomes the court jewelers, and in 1923, I believe, the first shop is yeah, opened. Yeah, that still exists on the... On, this, on the same oh, spot, yeah. yes. and you opened the boutique above in 2015? Yes, so that the boutique above was just my father's design studio. Mm -hmm. He used to sit and, and be there because, as you would see, we have the stone cutters and the goldsmiths there. Mm -hmm. So he just, because of the proximity, he wanted to be uh, close to them, and, you know, he was really an artist, so mm -hmm. he just wanted his space, and he would just go down to see the clients um, occasionally, o only if they were his friends. And most of my father's clients were his friends because mm -hmm. they really like were collectors of his work and all. And then the idea of opening it was, because it's still a family-run business, like the, the shop downstairs is run by my cousin and my uncle. I just took in the role of my father because that's Indian tradition. And then we just opened this pink boutique room that you saw. It's gorgeous. So, yeah. <laughs> so the idea of that was that there we could bring people who want by appointment studio. The, the whole idea came from like 
New York and Paris boutique salons because at Gym Palace you can have like 100 to 100 people walking in right so mm-hmm. when people want like the special attention and care then we take them upstairs so that that that's why we call it the private studio of the Castlewell family so that actually brings me to your father Mono so um i think most of our listeners probably do know that Sid's father Mono was internationally famous as a jeweler and in particular was invited six times i think to create works and collections for the metropolitan for the Met, museum yes. of art as well as exhibitions at somerset house and at the kremlin and um uh, the kennedy center mm-hmm. in washington dc but kremlin was the the latest one and unfortunately my father passed away in 2012 so he couldn't see it but in his honor uh, our family continued the show and he was probably one of the first indian jewelers to be exhibited at the kremlin it's amazing so he also was i think one of the first personality jewelry designers so sid's father was famously really incredibly charming very hands on with clients and maybe if you're willing could you just talk a little bit about what you think made his jewelry so distinctive my father was famous for his infectious smile I I remember it as a child you know every time means I was like 7 8 years old I will enter the room and I'll only hear like laughters coming out of his studio like there will people from all over the world coming to see him mm-hmm. and it was a thing means that's what I've heard and I I remember it as a child because I used to see it when people came the, he had that kind of an attraction power that all of his clients like I said became his friends just didn't want to leave is come they would be like come and they would spend 3 5 days mm-hmm. together going to the farmhouse you know like yeah um, evening cocktails at rambag spending the whole day at gem palace drinking coffees and i remember it's uh, one time they they asked my father one of the magazines and he had a very interesting answer to it you know because he he was a very humble and a modest person he's like munu why do every why does everyone come to gem palace what's your secret so my father said because we serve the best cappuccinos in town that's awesome so one aspect of munu's work that i'm really interested in and particularly for our collection so this is a peridot and spinel ring and one of the elements that i look for when i research a house to find iconic or phenomenal elements from the house is where have they had the biggest impact And so in my research on Munu one of the elements that keeps coming up mm-hmm. is that he really popularized the use of spinels. Can you talk a bit about your dad's interest in gems broadly but spinels specifically? So spinels were definitely my father's favorite stone. His love and passion for spinels ultimately turned me into a spinel lover too. Mm-hmm. So I've been seeing him collecting spinels for like last 25 years since i remember mm-hmm. his various trips to burma mm-hmm. people would always go looking for burmese rubies like you know they're the most valuable one but my father would look for spinels mm. at that time they didn't cost anything you know so he would like buy buy drums and drums and piles and piles of spinels and um, he always he always had this uh, special uh, thing for spinel because f- Firstly the spinels have a very vivid color it could mm-hmm. be it could come from really beautiful red that's why uh, people for the longest time confused spinels as rubies mm-hmm. as you would know it was only later people found out that timur's ruby was a spinel the the rubies they thought in british crown jewels were also spinels mm-hmm. and the russian czars were the biggest collectors of spinels including the mughal emperors and indian maharajas so just the history of it and all fascinated my father but apart from that he had a very keen eye for it because also sharon as you would know you can find spinels in various colors mm-hmm. they have a similar quality of ruby and sapphire but they are not corundum like that so they have uh, it could be come the spinels could come from blue to purple mm-hmm. to deep red to pink mm-hmm. but 
particularly for my father, he loved the pink spinels. Mm -hmm. And again, this is a very beautiful pink spinel and peridot ring in our collection from Muna the Gem Palace. And he had this ability to make spinels like with peridot. That's very unusual. I you love would not, that. You would not see people using peridot and spinels together. So, you know, he had this ability to merge mm -hmm. the other stones with that and create something spectacular. And actually, that is something I remember Oscar de la Renta saying, that is similarly as Oscar was famous for his use of color, he said that Munu also had an eye for color and gemstones and the combinations. Yes, because uh, they worked together mm -hmm. and, and they, did a, they did a collection together and Oscar, I, I believe, uh, had spent quite a bit of time in Jaipur with my father and they really had uh, great admiration for each other mm -hmm. in their own fields. Do you remember any of the other famous clients coming in to see your father? I mean, as a child, I would remember Prince Charles and Lady Diana walking mm -hmm. in, uh, like so Mick Jagger, um, and... I remember seeing the footage of Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton, yes, of course, when he did, and he uh, came to Jaipur on an official tour with Chelsea. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, they, they've been, what, what happens is like we keep our client list confidential, but it's sure. whatever is out. So Nicole Kidman has been there. Like anyone who, who comes to Rajasthan have- You they, have to go. <laughs> they, they've been lucky and, and, and they, they do end up once uh, coming to the Gem Palace. Um, for the jewelry nuts in our audience, one of my favorite celebrity stories from Moon in the Gem Palace is the commissioned piece from Gianni Agnelli for Marella Agnelli. Marianne, yes. So she recently passed and until her passing famously wore this, uh, I think it's ruby and emerald. Ruby and emerald. Uh, long bead mm. necklace that he designed for her, Mono did? No, it it was, it was during that time. It was an old family design from mm -hmm. her grandfather's time. But he was he was around and he did various versions of it. But Maria Nelly one is the most famous one. She wore it all the like, time, all the time, as yeah. you could see in all her pictures. It was literally attached to her body mm -hmm. throughout. But that traditional design, it is called baddi. Mm. So it was just, I think. So our family at the Gem Palace, we just made it a little more contemporary and modern mm -hmm. by making it that length. Mm -hmm. That's why Miss Ernielli loved it so much. Mm -hmm. Usually that's worn closer Shorter. to the night, but because in India, women would wear sarees, so they yeah. just like wear it like at 16, 17 inch length, what's yeah. the usual necklace length. But that is what was, it was really interesting was mm -hmm. The, we were the first people to make it at that length that it became very uh, modern at the same time. Wearing an Indian necklace that casually around became quite a thing and mm -hmm. people still talk about that necklace. It's still in oh, everybody's yeah. memory. So that was a definitely an iconic moment for Gem Palace and Absolutely. Our, our jewelry. Um, we'll, we'll put it on our Instagram, but for those of you that haven't seen it, just Google Marella Agnelli Munu, and it's going to come up because everybody, myself included, as soon as you see it, you want one. It's just incredibly beautiful. So actually, that, that brings me to how you got into the business. So you obviously were born into a ninth generation of a jewelry family. Did you always want to be a jeweler? Did you know you were going to be? creative director of Moon of the Gem Palace? Uh, well, you know, like when I, when you're growing up, you have all sorts of um, aspirations, right? Like somebody wants to become a pilot. That's, that's like a kid's thing. Like you wanna, you wanna join the army, you wanna do that, that's when you grow up. But in my case, I don't know, it was pretty evident, like since I was four or five, my father would take me on his jewelry trips you know, whether it be like London, Paris, and I was, since a very young age, I was exposed to the jewelry and all. Cool. So it was, it was very natural for me to think that I would get into it. If you'll honestly ask me, I, I wanted to be a travel writer mm. because I love traveling and, and do that. But it was actually when I was 17, 
and when I first assisted my father on the exhibition we did at the Met, mm -hmm. and uh, that exhibition, when I, I saw him work, and it was just such a joy to walk through the galleries of the Met at night. You know, they would open it for us. We we did this whole discussion. Uh, Philippe uh, de Montebello, who was mm. the uh, former director of the Met, um, we did a tie up, and that was the first time at such a young age I saw the whole process of, you know, creating jewelry and that, and that's when I knew that I'm gonna be a jeweler because that's the first time I understood that what kind of a passion my father had for, for jewelry mm -hmm. and seeing him work and also learning so much about our Indian jewelry because that exhibition was called Jeweled Arts of India and the Age of Mughals. Mm. So that was the first exposure for me to, and the entire summer holiday, I was with my father here and working on it. And wow. then after that, I knew that probably this is my path. And Amazing. And it gradually grew on me. And mm -hmm. now that's all what I can think I can do is to be a jeweler. Mm -hmm. So you are obviously a jeweler in the age of Instagram and social media, which is a very different experience than maybe even your father would have had. I know that he was famously copied throughout his lifetime as well and now it takes only seconds to see a design. Um, listeners may or may not know, but you really can't copyright designs in jewelry. It's extremely difficult, difficult to establish any concept of intellectual property. So would you mind speaking a bit about what is it like for you to be a jeweler well, in the age of Instagram? Like you said, you know, he was copied and I would say like imitation is the best form mm -hmm. of flattery. So I, you know, things have, it's been very interesting because I've been in that generation where I saw a traditional jewelry business then suddenly yeah. turning into this whole digital, you know, social media and the business. So I, I would call like Instagram to be a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. You know, it helps you, but it also, it's it's a big problem mm -hmm. with, with your designs being copied and mm -hmm. We definitely are feeling it, Sharon, because we we are now afraid to put any of a unique uh, right. piece um, on online because you know there's so much of like thought process, design process that you go sure. through. You go through like collection and collection of stones, and you pick up the best one, like mm -hmm. a cabochon, to do that. So that whole idea and concept is used. Mm -hmm. And if you put it on Instagram, yes, they're gonna be your followers and people seeing it. Mm -hmm. But the thing, like you said, which we can't control is like we can't stop it from being copied and then right. they'll make the same thing with like a really bad quality cabochon and right. not using the same and make it in silver. So it's, it's, it's been a problem and uh, I really wish that people, all the jewelry mm -hmm. people get together and, and this whole trademark and patent and the design mm -hmm. thing is taken more seriously because it's really unfair to and and i say it for every jeweler that when the designs are copied uh, blatantly and you can't even do anything about it i just feel it's very unfair and we all as a jewelry community put together should take it more seriously yeah. and do something about it is what my feeling is i agree with you one of our missions with beekman new york is to celebrate the heritage and the artistry of the houses so what you'll see on our site is that we identify not only the houses, but we'll identify, if we can trace through the supply chain, we'll actually identify the various stages, everyone who has worked on a piece. Exactly. And we feel very strongly about supporting the actual houses, the actual artistry, and we encourage you to come and visit and really learn about what makes each house, in this case, Moon of the Gym Palace, so distinctive. And we're gonna talk about some of your pieces as well as some inspiration pieces. There is this very gray line between inspiration and copying. And in fairness, it's not always easy to determine. So, yes. for example, you know, there are many European high jewelry pieces from 65 to 75 in chandelier earrings with very, very Indian elements clearly inspired by India, but which may use a different color choice of stone, unusual stones, a different technique that we would call inspired by and reasonably inspired by. 
On the other hand, that line isn't always obvious. So for example, for the Beekman New York collection, I don't include Tutti Frutti in our Cartier collection because the carving of colored gemstones into fruit Start leaves and berries yes. started in India. Yes, and so for me, because iconic for us starts with the origin, I choose to exclude Tutti Frutti. But you know, it's a personal choice. It's not an obvious, there are many people who collect Cartier Tutti Frutti. But for me, for this collection, I consider that to be part of the Indian technique that I would put in a different category. Um, on the other hand, when we look, and we're going to go to the table in a minute to look at some pieces, there are some very beautiful examples of the historical influence and inspiration of the work from India across the board mm -hmm. in European high jewelry that I think we can celebrate and enjoy. But defining that line, I think particularly in the age of Instagram, it's very difficult. What makes a piece recognizably Bulgari? How does Bulgari protect it? What makes a piece recognizably from Munu? So for example, this gorgeous book of Munu's jewels, Munu Irresistible Jewels, in some cases, the dealer that I bought this book from, he said he had to ask for permission because there's such an issue with copying that some of these images could be used in the wrong way. And exactly. it is, it's a real tension. On one hand, they cannot imitate the quality, and you and I are going to talk about the hours and the research and the search that goes into these pieces. Yeah. That can't be imitated. The difficulty is that we want our listeners to know the difference so that you demand the original, right? That you're looking for the house, their heritage, their quality when you buy a piece. Exactly, yes. See, India, China, I would like to say, India has always been a big, big, big source of inspiration to all the European. Agreed. Uh, jewelry houses, right from like Jacques Cartier when, mm -hmm. you know, he came to India in 1911, exactly. Documented to study the Tutti Frutti carving. And also, the, he used to go to Bombay to, to get the natural pearls. Mm -hmm. The natural pearl people used to come from Bahrain. Mm -hmm. And you know, so India has always been the center for jewelry for many, many years, and has been an inspiration to Cartier, Bulgari, uh, Everybody, everyone, Van Cleef and, for sure. And it's it's interesting what you what you had said that how they change the colors and everything because in India, as you would know, traditionally we don't use sapphires, right? Because sapphires uh, for for Indian people they feel that it represents uh, you know Saturn and mm -hmm. and it has a very strong planetary influence. So if it doesn't suit you, so. I think that's an interesting fact for, for the listeners who mm -hmm. are not from India to know that traditionally uh, a person who would buy a sapphire would would not wear it but keep that sapphire underneath his pillow, mm. underneath their pillow for like two, three days and see how the day is going. Let's see how it works out. And if everything's <laughs> all right, they'll, they'll, they'll use the sapphire. But Generally, people don't want to take the risk and they just keep the sapphires out. Mm -hmm. So now coming back to that, like what you said, so if there were chandelier earrings in India, but you will only see emerald, ruby, mm -hmm. diamonds and pearls, mm -hmm. but you'll never see sapphires right. in it. Sapphire was only used in India in the nine gemstone, which is famously called the Navratna. Mm -hmm. Navratna depicts okay. nine planets. And with that, Saturn say, comes yes, in. Yes. So, so the other stones that um, it cuts off the negativity of the sapphire that can bring. Mm -hmm. So all these beliefs in India was also fascinating to a uh, lot of like jewelry houses to understand what the thing's going and, and also the, the designs that we had, they all were inspired by the Indian architecture, Indian mm -hmm. history, and that still you can see. And mm -hmm. we can talk, we will talk more about the Meenakari and enameling mm -hmm. work. So yes. Really interesting. So we're going to step like, over yeah. to the table now and take a look at some of the pieces and we'll talk a bit more about this line because I do have some pieces that I want to discuss with you because I think they're nice examples of inspiration, a good marriage between an Indian influence and a European, and European. high jewelry house. So these are both peridot rings. The one on my left is Verdura. The one on the right is Moon in the Gem Palace. 
So I think these are a really good way to talk about how these are both high jewelry houses that show quite interesting differences in style but coexist really beautifully. And our listeners may or may not know, but the high jewelry community is really that, a community. And you, in fact, are not only very close to Ward and Nico Landrigan of Verdura and Belperon, but you are, in fact, Nico's son's godfather. Yes. So there's a long family history of collaboration and friendship. Your younger brother interned with and, Verdura. Uh, Nico actually came and lived at our house for three months. And uh, Ward and my dad have been doing business for like 30 years, mm -hmm. about 25 years before they met. So Vardura and the Gem Palace family is literally like have been the closest for many and are very happy. Like uh, I can't wait for my godson Rory to come mm -hmm. and, and work with us at Gem Palace so when he cool. grows. So I'm going to put these two down. And, and these, I think, are a really good example of what I consider to be perfect inspiration from Indian influence. So these are Bulgari, um, maybe early 1990s. These earrings are the precursor to the Allegra collection. What's interesting about these, I think, is they're, first of all, they're chandelier earrings, which date back to the Mughal period for yes. sure. But the choice of stones, as you said, these are sapphires, yes. which we would not see in India, but also they feature a briolette cut, and the briolette cut does date back to the Mughal period, but in a craftsmanship and a style that is recognizably Bulgari. Would you agree? Yes, I completely agree. And like I'd mentioned, they would, they've used sapphires and all, and had it been like a traditional uh, Indian earrings, you would have seen all the Christmas colors, as we call exactly. it. Exactly. Uh, red, green, and, and, and diamonds, white. Mm -hmm. uh, but you would not see sapphires put in it. So it's, it's, it's a great example of how the European households have I, I used totally the agree. This is a great, happy marriage of Indian influence and European high jewelry design. I agree. Yep, great. Then another one that I think is very interesting is our readers may or may not know, but the sotoir, the long necklace ending in, you know, a, a tassel or a pendant of some sort, dates back to the headdress worn in Mughal times. Can you talk a bit about that? The the turban ornament. Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, you know, India has had, India. You have jewelry for every part of your body because adornment has always been the first thing for, for humans, you know, before mm -hmm. the jewelry, they would like tattoo your faces, then the jewelry. So since humanity has been, the adornment has been there. So in India, especially you have like various ornaments that you'll only find it in our culture, not there's like something called hatful. Hatful is the hand ornaments when you mm -hmm. wear it. There is armbands, which were called the baju bands. And the most importantly was the turban pin, which mm -hmm. was, uh, a symbol of power, strength, and royalty mm -hmm. that the Maharajas really adorn themselves in uh, in those turban pins. And as you'll see in history, in India, men wore more jewelry than women. Mm -hmm. And um, rude. <laughs> <laughs> and the turban ornament is definitely a very important part of a man's jewelry. Like even in if you remember, I'd shown you my turban ornament mm -hmm. that my father designed. I that, really want it. That I would be wearing it on lie. my. Really want it. And um, so, so that's the idea of sarpej, and they would usually uh, come with like two parts. One was kalangi, and one was the bottom part. And nowadays, how we are doing it is that you can take it off, and mm -hmm. after the wedding, the lower part. Mm -hmm becomes into a choker and goes to the wife. Oh, that's but, but, nice. Uh, or at least she gets to share. Yes. <laughs> so for me, this is also a nice example of European inspiration. Because while you have the use of cabochon gems, which I would consider Indian, this stone is coral, which we would not have seen. And can you talk a bit about the traditional technique of embedding the gemstone in the gold? The Kundan technique? Mm-hmm. Yes, so kundan, or you would say the inlay technique. So the whole idea is if you look at the other style of jewelry, like when we say the more modern uh, art deco style of jewelry, you would see they hold the stone with mm -hmm. prong setting. Mm -hmm. In India, it was 
it was the kundan te technique was used where you would embed the stone and mm -hmm. you would put so much gold around it that the gold held the stone and there was no no prongs, no prongs. so it always gave a cleaner look mm -hmm. and it is a hammered 24 karat gold it's wow. it's it's as it's thin really as soft. like a paper leaf and then it's so soft that you can't use your hand to it you need to use a tool and you uh put it around the diamond and you fill the whole gap with that technique so when you would traditionally ask about Indian jewelry, they would say Kundan Meenakari. Mm. So there are two techniques. Kundan was done in the front, mm -hmm. which is encrusting mm -hmm. of gold around the stone. Mm -hmm. And Meenakari was the enamel, which was done at the back. Mm -hmm. So I'll come with that. A lot of people would ask, why so much work at the back? So with that, I would like to tell you, Shan, because there was this concept, and my father always told me that in India and in the Mughal period and all they believed, that it's not only what the eyes can see, but mm -hmm. the body sees and feels as well. That's so lovely. it was for your inner beauty. Mm -hmm. So they, they put all this enamel work mm -hmm. just for the person to, to feel the beauty, and it was for your, for your soul. I would encourage our listeners, whenever you borrow one of our Moon of the Gem Palace pieces, take a look at the back, because everything was selected for exactly that. It's as beautiful on the back. You get a very interesting, I think, attention to detail that we consider to be iconic to the house. Yes. So the next piece I want to talk about is this glorious rainbow moonstone necklace. So I'm wearing the rainbow moonstone collar bib necklace from Moon of the Gem Palace. And I would love to use this one as an example. So how many hours would you say would go into a piece like this? So Sharon, you know, when you talk about a jewelry piece being made, uh, it's usually, and I would like to point it out to our listeners, usually people would think from the start of when you actually start the manufacturing or the production mm -hmm. to the day it is finally at the showroom. Mm -hmm. But what a lot of people tend to forget is there is something called the collection time or the mm -hmm. collection period mm -hmm. that goes into it. So for this necklace that you're wearing to get all the moonstones of the similar quality with the same blue in it, we had to go through over 3,000 carats of rough to, wow. to, to find uh, close to like 300 carats of moonstones. So you mm -hmm. can imagine the time that goes into it also then there is a design thought process so there's collection periods design thought process and then the production thing so a necklace like this uh took us almost like nine to ten months wow. right from starting of like cutting the rough from rough to um, moonstones and then if you'll see what's really interesting in this necklace is how the multicolor sapphires have been put at randomly at places that mm -hmm. just gives it a very interesting and a modern contemporary look. Mm -hmm. So so that actually brings me to another question. So you did use sapphires here, right? Yes. The famous knot in traditional Indian jewelry, but you are in fact a modern house as well. And I'm curious, given that you have set up in other markets, most notably in New York City, yes. How do you keep the spirit of the house alive in a different market? How do you think about incorporating elements of the market into your designs? I mean, see, every culture and every place is different, right? So in India, traditionally, if I made this necklace for India, I would have had to make, make earrings. Mm -hmm. Because they, they, in India, we wear everything matching. Aurora. Like Yeah, so yeah. It, it's a whole jewelry suite mm -hmm. with the bracelet, with the ring. However, it's not the case in New York. Mm -hmm. New York, you could just like wear the earrings and you'll either wear just the necklace mm -hmm. and it's also the day-to-day -day wear. Mm -hmm. So out here, with the jewelry that we make, it's, it's more like everyday wear, but it could still be a very expensive piece of jewelry, but what you can just uh, wear it casually. So there's famous T-shirt necklaces. Mm -hmm. It became, so Munnu's T-shirt necklaces became a phenomena where I would see a lot of ladies in Aspen and New York mm -hmm. would just wear his traditional rose-cut Indian mm -hmm. necklaces mm -hmm. on a black and white T-shirt and go and, and go for lunch, you and know? you're done. <laughs> so, so it's just the way how you, you talk about jewelry and, mm -hmm. and how you make a woman feel. Mm 
mm-hmm. about jewelry that's how they feel wearing it like that that's that's the idea so these two bangles one is turquoise and black onyx and the other is black lacquer and turquoise enamel, yeah. enamel and turquoise and pave white diamonds i think these are a great example of pieces that you have created as creative director um, I love them. And like you said, like the t-shirt necklace, you can wear them dressed up, dressed down. Exactly. They're super comfortable. They're really beautiful. Could you talk a bit about the inspiration for these? Well, the inspiration was like, you know, these are the colors that you would uh, see it a lot in the Egyptian collection when we did for the Met. So they were usually lapis and turquoise. Mm-hmm. So just using that inspiration and these colors obviously like going so well with each other, I just thought let's make it into more of a modern mm-hmm. contemporary bracelets that it could go even with an Indian outfit like the, these bracelets could be worn even with saris or mm-hmm. you can wear it in like New York City and walk around. So it's very versatile that it, it goes with everything. Absolutely. And like you said, they're just as beautiful on the inside. The finish is so gorgeous. The they're work. so comfortable. It's really gorgeous, gorgeous work. And we're excited to have them in our collection. They're just beautiful. So I wanted to also ask you about this fabulous ring in our collection. I know this one comes from your father's design. Yeah. So how would you talk about this one? Well, this is what he called, he did this in many colors, and this is what he called his disco ball rings, Mm -hmm. that you could stack them with many, many, many different colors. And and, and they were fun because my father always used to say that jewelry should not be taken too seriously, it Mm -hmm. should be fun. So that's that's how he came up with these disco ball, poison rings, Mm -hmm. and, you know, naughty rings. So we'll... Yeah, this, this one's fantastic. And the interesting thing is that the work is so precise. It looks like it would be difficult to keep this on, but it's actually really sturdy. It's very impressive. It, it's done in platinum. And as you know, mm-hmm. platinum is the hardest metal to work mm-hmm. with. And that's what keeps it uh, really strong and, and sturdy, like you said. Yes. Do you do all of the work in India? Most of it. This is one of your pieces as creative director. Uh, this is um, a rose quartz set with pave white diamonds. It's a, I, I love it on a pointer finger. I feel like it could be equally gorgeous on any finger of yes. the hand. I love it for a man as a pinky ring. I think it's super but, chic. Well, the idea behind this ring, Shan, was, you know, people, you would hardly see them using rose quartz because it's a really inexpensive stone. Mm-hmm. But I just think so it's a very interesting idea to to use rose quads and set diamonds around mm-hmm. it usually it. people would just do rose rose quads into like figurative animals and exactly. do that but but when i was designing this and the whole idea was just to have like a rose quads ball mm-hmm. and set it with diamond pave around it just mm-hmm just for the fun sake. And I love the way this stone is set. So when you look underneath, you don't see really any metal. You just have this beautiful orb that almost looks like it's floating. It's gorgeous. It's really like a, a fortune beautiful. fortune teller. Yeah, it's absolutely gorgeous. So these earrings I love. I think they are so much fun. They have so much movement. So they're onyx, diamond, and pearl. Sounds super and awesome. One of the reasons that I chose them for our collection is I think they could work equally with a super modern, very minimalist look, but they also could mix in with our actual deco pieces with no you know, difference or issue. Yeah, it's a very art deco piece as you see it. And the whole idea of this is that these could be an amazing evening cocktail earrings mm-hmm. that you wear it. You could also wear them during the day because Mm -hmm. the colors are very subtle and they're easy and the I I just love the idea of using onyx and diamonds because it it makes it very versatile. Mm -hmm. I love them they're beautiful. So another piece I wanted to ask you about now I know that you famously don't wear a lot of jewelry yourself but we feel like jewelry should be for absolutely everyone and we wanted to show you some of the pieces are from our collection that we thought would be good on you. So this is a tiger pin of Van Cleef and Arpels from 1970 and 
the reason I thought this might be a nice one is that it features a lot of Indian influence, right? You have the tiger, you have the cabochon emerald eyes. What do you think? It's beautiful. I mean, just just the fact that it's a tiger, that's what <laughs> represents India st- straight away. I, I just feel men, nowadays men don't wear that much of jewelry, but it's still a, a big style statement when mm-hmm. when men wear brooches and mm-hmm. and they have like in india you would know traditionally we have these seven buttons mm-hmm. which are like bejeweled and we wear it for the wedding mm-hmm. and uh, usually people would, would wear those buttons and a brooch pin mm-hmm. whenever you go and attend a royal wedding or you'll go and attend like a very close family or friends wedding you I you like wear that. that but i want it for every day for everyone how do you feel about these? These are bog, bog. oak. They're stags. Are these and they're from, Yes, the cufflinks from England from roughly 1950. They're gorgeous. They're gorgeous, right? I thought those would be good on you. Yeah. Right? They'll and they're be, chic. They're very chic. And this mechanism, as you know, men mm-hmm. have less patience yes, exactly. to get dressed up. <laughs> so so th- this mechanism is great that you could just like do that. Slide it and, in. And open it. Twist so. it and you're done. These ones I thought were very interesting because they are from 1880. Isn't that interesting? Oh, wow. Yeah. So it's some of the earliest pieces that we've found in a cufflink. And again, we have the non-Indian sapphire, but we have a very happy tourmaline, citrine, and peridot. Now, again, that's not for the most impatient French cuff wearer because you have to mean it. It takes a minute. Exactly. But they're stunning and happy and yummy colors. Beautifully made. And, and I, love the, I love the combination of all four different colors. Another way that I thought we could play is with what were traditionally tie pins. So this wonderful acorn, for example, with a is beautiful a, sapphire in it, mm-hmm. a blue sapphire. And that's 1870. This is a Burma ruby and diamond tie pin from roughly 1900. I mean, look at the setting in it. It's, it's, Isn't that insane? It's incredible. So I thought instead of your buttons, maybe just slip one or two in. You could even do three. I think it would be really chic. Yeah, you can do this. And, and this is the earliest use of amethyst that I found at Cartier. So this is 1900. This is... Super chic and very right? simple, yeah. I agree. I thought this looked like you. So this would be one that I would think that you and, and Tutu might borrow. Yes, we definitely would. I, I, I just feel that men should, you know, like you said, it's 1870s mm-hmm. and all. Uh, that At that time, they had a much more of a fun, fun and yeah. fashion sense than, right. than nowadays. What So this whole concept of wearing tie pin and all is unfortunately... Well, we want to bring it back, and this is a fun way to do it because you can borrow them from us and give it a try, yeah, right? And, See and how you feel. You guys are doing an amazing job, and yes. Right? I mean, you spend all this time as men grooming yourselves, being attractive, wearing a nice outfit. Why shouldn't you finish it off with some extra gling? So we were talking about your father and his use of spinels. I think this earring is a fabulous example of really unusual, beautiful red spinels. So we have a cushion cut at the top and a pear shape. These are gorgeous. Yes, yeah, so you know, like by what I'd mentioned, my father's love for spinels and spinels having this incredible uh, luster and the quality that it has, that it was confused as rubies for the longest time. Mm-hmm. So what you see here is quite a beautiful mix of like everything that we talked about, mm-hmm. the shape, the how, how the work has been done on the back, mm-hmm. you know, the reverse often... If it's the main part in Gem Palace jewelry, you can mm-hmm. see is that the reverse is much more interesting or prettier than the front. Mm-hmm. But in this, I would say the front is also quite interesting. Shana, as you see, uh, there is a cushion shape on the top, around in the middle, and mm-hmm. a pear shape at the bottom. And also the movement that mm-hmm. you see is what really was important. Instead mm-hmm. of just having a stiff thing, the mm-hmm. movement when when you move so. He always said that the jewelry should come alive mm-hmm. once it's worn. 
Oh, that's fun. So this brings up a question for me, which is when you're designing, for you specifically, what would you say is typically the split for you between designing around a stone and where the design is more the emphasis in a piece? So, well, uh, you know, it, it really depends. Um, I would say for us, workmanship is the primary uh, idea. So I would say like 30 to 70, mm -hmm. 30 percent being the stone, 70 percent being the workmanship and craftsmanship. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that we don't pay attention to the quality of stones. It mm -hmm. has to be a certain really uh, certain quality mm -hmm. that a company passes through, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the whole idea is the same thing that you're seeing. This could have been a very boring design by prong setting and just mm -hmm. setting it in, you know, 18 karat white gold. Mm -hmm. But instead to do it in the traditional Indian gold and do the filigree work. And if you look at it, how carefully each and every stone has been set it's inside amazing. the filigree. Yeah. So the craftsmen really have to be really patient mm -hmm. to be doing this. So, so this is what I call the work of patience and passion. Oh, I like that. One needs to be passionate and very patient about creating these pieces mm -hmm. because we are not in a hurry of like making jewelry. We are not in a commercial race. We mm -hmm. are more towards creating pieces of work of art. Mm -hmm. That's the idea. These baseball bat earrings I've been wearing our whole podcast, and I, I love, love them. them. They are so light. They're so much fun to wear. They're so sparkly. Can you talk about them a bit? So, you know, as, as you see these, you see the movement, the articulation, like I said, when you wear them, mm -hmm. it comes alive because mm -hmm. every movement you make, you move. So, so what is really important also in jewelry making that a lot of people tend to forget is the movement mm -hmm. because you cannot just make it like things very stiff mm -hmm. it has to be like how you say you have need to be flexible in life jewelry also needs to be flexible and fun Fine. right so what you see here is even at the back instead of just leaving it empty and you could mm -hmm. see how the diamonds are set we put this really interesting jali work jali is the gold filigree work mm -hmm. that was done gorgeous and, and and then these are an interesting design means this has been with our family and our our like the family designed it, but if, if you would see this, these were, you would call them the baseball, ba baseball bat earrings, <laughs> but uh, we call it the sparkle earrings because mm -hmm. in India we have the similar shape mm -hmm. that we, the sparkles that we use at Diwali. Oh, okay. So, so we call it full jari, that's the sparkle. Oh, I like that. So, so these are quite interesting and, and really, really fun earrings. And for those of you at home, one of the tests for the quality of pavé work is you run it against silk to see if it snags. This is unbelievably refined pavé work. It is so smooth. I'm wearing silk and there's just absolutely nothing. It's gorgeous work. Really, really beautiful That's and super test, fun to yes. wear. So we were talking about the idea of a piece being as beautiful on the back as in the front, and I think this turtle is just out of this world. And I'm hoping you can talk a bit. This is a turtle pin, and we see cabochon gemstones inlaid on the front. And then on the back, there is the most beautiful work. So I'm going to ask you to talk a bit about the turtle itself, why a turtle. This is a great example of articulation. The legs move, the tail moves, the head moves. Again, a very good example of the difficulty in the technique itself. And then also if you'll talk about the work on the back. So Shan, this is a great example of everything we have talked about. Yeah. Indian jewelry, Indian beliefs, the astrological symbol I had mentioned Navratna, mm -hmm. which depicts nine planets. Turtle, let's, let's get back on turtle. Turtle's uh, significance in Hindu mythology is a huge significance because they believe the world is held on a turtle's back. Oh. And uh, turtle oh. also is considered a very auspicious and a lucky animal. And as you know, the turtles live a long life. Mm -hmm. So turtle was also a a sign of longevity mm -hmm. for 
good auspicious long life mm -hmm. and reproductivity mm -hmm. so Love it. so they 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 had a lot of like concepts behind it so when my father had initially designed it many many years ago the whole idea of this was that the world is held on turtles back so mm -hmm. he literally depicted the nine planets oh, that's wow. the world for us and on turtles back and the concept that it's not only the front but the re the reverse has to be as pretty as the front that's where this the work at the back came it's stunning and the whole idea in this is again the versatility of design that it could be worn on a black cord string mm -hmm. or it can be used as a brooch pin love it it's absolutely beautiful I can't thank you enough for coming today. This was so much fun. It was absolutely my honor. You know, at, at Beekman, New York, we're really committed to the idea of recirculating these works of art and introducing new people to the heritage of the houses, to gemology, to respecting the pieces. And by borrowing pieces, we hope that they'll learn more. As any of you, you know, listening who've heard our earlier podcasts know, we don't carry current pieces because we're not, we're in the ecosystem with the houses. Houses. So we are a respectful friend of Sid. We're a respectful friend of Verdura. We have no interest in competing. But we want you to learn about these pieces and share with us as you know we coexist in this wonderful world of luxury high jewelry. So thank you so much for being our partner. We really, really appreciate it. No, thank you so much. And we we love working with you and uh, we love your vision and I I look forward to it promising future. Same. More to come. Together. Thank you so much. Thank you, really Shari. appreciate it.